Welcome, let's talk about serial killers. My name is Sheesh Merriweather and I'm the founder of Crime Viral Online. Today I'll be doing what I do best, which is talking about serial killers. Statistically speaking, you should not be afraid of serial killers as they are responsible for less than 1% of the murders committed every year. It's actually your immediate family members, close friends and partners who you share a bed with at night you really should be keeping an eye on. Which brings us to the topic of today's video, how serial killers lead double lives. Many serial killers are completely able to compartmentalize in their minds the most gruesome murders at their own hands. We know from research that this capability in serial killers is key in order for them to carry out normal lives. Once they've compartmentalized these murders, they do not appear suspicious. So when anybody finds out that their partner is a murder suspect, they are genuinely shocked by who they are sleeping in bed next to at night has the ability to do that. Being able to compartmentalize also means that the serial killer will show no signs of remorse. The murder itself is finished, the equivalent of you and I writing it down on a piece of paper, scrumpling it up and throwing it in the bin. They don't sit there in the dinner table at night thinking, where did it all go wrong? What have I done? Compartmentalization is something that you can train your brain to do at any age, either subconsciously or consciously. For future serial killers, this often begins in adolescence when they first start to feel those hormonal urges. Typically what will happen is the teenager will express this fondness for people socially. However, we do know that psychopaths and sociopaths are stunted in their emotional growth. They do not bond easy with others and they have no capacity for empathy. So then these dark fantasies begin to form in their minds. They typically have themes of dominance, revenge, molestation and control. As many sexual fantasies are not openly discussed, their mind will be consumed with these thoughts of causing another person suffering and there is nobody there to intervene to explain to them the long-term lasting negative effects of this thought pattern. Robert K. Ressler in his book, Whoever Fights Monsters, revealed that these fantasies in serial killers' minds is one of the most difficult topics for them to openly discuss. They will often speak freely about the murders that they have committed, yet these fantasies and almost all notorious serial killers had these fantasies as teenagers. This is the one topic they have never said out loud. Yet it is one of the most significant developments in their journey of becoming a cold-blooded killer. So what they do is they take these fantasies and they compartmentalize them in their minds when nobody else can get to them. Yet whenever they wish to access this twisted world they've created, they can do this easily. They are essentially the only gatekeepers to that fantasy world. So later in life when these twisted fantasies become a reality, they have trained their brains so well being able to compartmentalize this world, they can do this with ease. Convicted murderer Russell Williams broke into at least 82 homes to steal underwear belonging to women and young girls. Once back home, he then took photos of himself posing in this underwear. His crimes later escalated to sexually assaulting victims in their homes and eventually he murdered two women by asphyxiation in Canada. Williams was a gifted pilot, a former colonel in the Canadian forces, who even passed security clearance so he was able to pilot the Queen of England and the Prime Minister of Canada during his 23 year long military career. Yet he was secretly a monster in uniform. He was eventually caught when tire tracks found at the crime scene led investigators to his home. There they found he lived a quiet life in a cottage with his wife in this quiet neighborhood and she had no idea about his crimes. Following his full confession, which took some time to get from him, he was sentenced to two life sentences. Then in 2014, four years after his arrest, his wife was sued by one of the sexual assault victims who claimed that she knew that her husband was a sexual deviant and that she could have done something to prevent these crimes. Her lawyers completely opposed this and stated there is no evidence whatsoever 
for these allegations being made. It is difficult to imagine a wife who sleeps in the same bed as her husband every night has no knowledge whatsoever of his sordid twisted fancies and these crimes, this double life that he's leading. Yet with many serial killers we have seen this time after time again. Williams kept many personal trophies of these attacks on his home computer. We have another video on this channel all about serial killer trophies if you want to check that out. Williams's photo collection of his own, these were crime scene photos and videos of the attacks. Investigators later revealed that these were hidden in a complex system of subfolders on his computer. He also told his wife that he was out walking late at night to ease the pain of his sore back. Two other sinister serial killers who had wives that had no idea about their twisted crimes. Russian serial killer Mikhail Popko, also known as the werewolf, he used axes, knives, screwdrivers to murder 22 women. He even beheaded one of his victims and ate her heart after carving this out of her chest. His wife of 28 years told the court that she had always felt safe with her husband. And serial killer Jerome Brudos, also known as the shoe fetish slayer, he kept the feet of his victims in a freezer at his home in the garage. He told his wife whilst he was working in the garage she was not to interrupt him and he set up an intercom system so she could speak to him if she needed to. So you might ask why would a serial killer bother getting married in the first place when they have all this sneaking around to do? Would it not be more convenient for them just to live entirely alone? Often serial killers who have no capacity for empathy or remorse may become attracted to the concept of marriage because it offers crucial emotional stability. They are living a violent risky life by continuing these horrendous crimes so returning home to a familiar place where they can play the role of the doting husband often that leads to a downtime period where they're not in a killing phase that we refer to as the in control self. Between 1974 and 1991, before he was caught, serial killer Dennis Rader haunted the community of Wichita, Kansas. He tortured and murdered 10 people, including two children. He himself, a former Boy Scout leader, he was leading this double life. He was also a bylaw officer and an elder in his church. His wife and two children were completely unaware of his crimes. During his horrific killing spree, he sent letters to the media with details of his crimes and he even signed the letters BTK, which stands for his murderous method of bind, torture and kill. Kerry Rawson, his daughter, wrote the book A Serial Killer's Daughter and in this she writes, My dad repeatedly taught us to be fearful of strangers, not to open doors to people we didn't know, to be extremely cautious. When I was younger, he worked as a security alarm installer and I always figured that was where he picked up this paranoia. Raider himself never had a home alarm installed. Instead, he just kept the security stickers on the windows and he also taped around the doors in his house. He said that this would be enough to deter the bad guys into breaking into the house. Also, whilst they were on holiday together as a family, he would regularly use passwords to come in and out of the rooms. Even though he was actually the only one entering and leaving the room, his paranoia was extreme. He is drilling into the minds of his loved ones how important security and safety are in the family home, yet at the same time he is stalking, torturing and killing victims, robbing them of their own security and safety. Although Raider never went out to kill men and children, he was targeting women in the local area. He would not hesitate to kill the entire family if they got in the way of his plan. He would bring various items with him to the victim's house in a bowling bag called his kill kit. He would then cut the phone lines to prevent the victims from calling for help. And he also changed his clothes. He had different clothes to wear known as his hit clothes. Raider also kept a knife and a gun used to threaten the victim to gain control and then he would either strangle the victim to death or suffocate them with a plastic bag. Once he strangled his victims he would do this repeatedly as a form of torture and he also became sexually aroused from watching them struggle. 
He is another serial killer who is known for taking personal items belonging to the victims. As souvenirs, he kept underwear, driver's license, pictures. He also took photos of himself wearing the clothing of his victims and also this creepy face mask. This twisted collection of Polaroids was kept in a box under the floorboards at his home. Raider said that if his wife would have come across this box, she would be looking at the mother load of evidence for his crimes. So I'm not saying it's ever okay to go through your partner's personal belongings. I'm just saying on this occasion, if she would have looked through this, many lives could have been inevitably saved. Raider was captured in 2005 and he later confessed that he was stalking an 11th victim, a young woman in the neighborhood, but he was caught before he managed to take another innocent life. So hopefully you have learned something new here today. The facts are it is very unlikely that your partners are serial killers, but it's not impossible. Thank you for watching this video guys. We'll be back next week with even more video content. Feel free to like, subscribe, comment below with any suggestions that you have for future videos.